Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has proven to be a very provocative and interesting one on the book of Galatians. This particular lesson is lesson number 10 in that series for September 2 of 2017 entitled, The Two Covenants. The Two Covenants. Hmm. Let's see what that's going to be all about. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you in our earnest desire, recognizing your presence to discover the meanings that Paul and you intended for us to learn from uh, this portion of the book of Galatians. The covenants, and you know how much discussion and differences of opinion have rocked the Christian world over those issues. Help us now to see clearly uh, what was the role of each of those covenants, why they were there in the Bible, and what we should learn that might be of use to us in that light is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What's a covenant? An agreement can be between two or three people, depends what's involved. Mm -hmm. It could even be two people. groups of people, yes. but at least two people. You've got to have at least two people to be involved. Um, there, there are three major covenants mentioned in the Old Testament. The original covenant was between God and Abraham. We'll be talking a little bit more about that later. What are some terms, before you go into that, what are some terms that we would use other than covenants to describe the covenant? Agreement. Contract. Might, a contract, contract yeah. would be probably closer to that in our day. For those of us who don't have the old time English. I see. Number two, the covenant with the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai. We'll talk quite a bit about that. And three, the covenant with the children of Israel at the time of their Babylonian captivity, spelled out in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Um, well, I guess we'll, we'll come back to that later. We're going to focus mostly on the first two. We usually speak of only two covenants because the renewed covenant to the children of Israel at the time of the Babylonian captivity was largely a repeat of the covenant with Abraham back in the beginning. So we had that first covenant with Abraham. Then we have the covenant which we usually refer to as the first covenant. And then we have a second covenant which is really a repeat of the one who was, who was really originally in the beginning. So our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide puts it this way. Christians who reject the authority of the Old Testament often see the giving of the law in Sinai as being inconsistent with the gospel. They conclude that the covenant given on Sinai represents an era, a dispensation, from a time in human history when salvation was based on obedience to the law. But because the people failed to live up to the demands of the law, God, they say, ushered in a new covenant, a covenant of grace through the merits of Jesus Christ. This then is their understanding of the two covenants, the old based on law and obedience to the law, and the new based on grace, the grace of Jesus Christ. That's, you'll find that in the section for August 26 in your Bible study guide. So, let's start off and say what was the essential difference between the Sinai Covenant, which is often referred to as the First or Old Covenant, and the New Covenant given at the time of the Babylonian captivity, which was repeated several times in the New Testament. What was the basic difference, the real difference? The promises. The promises, okay. And who's doing the promising? In the old, it's the people who are doing the promising. In exactly. The new, it's totally on the promises of God. Exactly. So the real difference between the old covenant, the first covenant, and the new covenant is based on who's doing the promising. And we'll see that. Our Christian friends usually see these two covenants as representations of how God has related to his people in two different time periods. But the essential difference between the two covenants is the relationship between the covenanting parties, that is, who's doing the promising, rather than the time period involved. We could even go way back to the time of Cain and Abel. Cain represented a kind of old or first covenant relationship with God. 
He wanted to please God by something that he could do himself, a kind of do-it-yourself religion. How well do do-it-yourself religions work? Kind's, well, what Cain did was selfish. He really turned his back on what God had told him. And Abel, as we know, did followed God's directions exactly, shed blood for his sacrifice. He trusted God and God's grace for their relationship. Well, Cain's approach was a selfish one. I could do it my, my way, I, 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 the way I choose to do it. And we know what the result was. It made that Cain's... explanation mostly comes from Ellen White, right? About you do it yourself, religion, and so forth? No, the whole concept of selfish versus non-selfish. Well, I think you could get that idea out of the Bible in Genesis 5 pretty easily. Genesis four, 5? 4 and 5, yeah. Um, well, look at Genesis, I'm sorry, Galatians 4, 21 to 31. This is the part we're focusing on. Let me just read that passage quickly. Let me ask those of you who want to be, this is Paul, of course. Let me ask those of you who want to be subject to the law, do you not hear what the law says? It says that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, the other by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the usual way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of God's promise. Now we already said that the second covenant, what we call the second covenant, is based on whose promises? God's. God's promises. So there's some parallels here. Right? These things can be understood as a figure. The two women represent two covenants. The one whose children are born in slavery is Hagar, and she represents the covenant made at Mount Sinai. Hagar, who stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia, is a figure of the present city of Jerusalem in slavery with all its people. Imagine Paul, who used to be a Pharisee and went and spent years in Jerusalem to learn everything that he could learn down there, now calling Jerusalem a city in slavery. But the heavenly Jerusalem is free, and she is our mother. For the scripture says, Be happy, you childless woman. Shout and cry with joy, you who never felt the pains of childbirth. For the woman who was deserted will have more children than the woman whose husband never left her. Now you, my brothers and sisters, are God's children as a result of his promise, just as Isaac was. At that time, the son who was born in the usual way was persecuted, uh, usually persecuted the one who was born because of God's Spirit. And it is the same now. But what does the scripture say? It says, send the slave woman and her slave away, her son away. So what's Paul suggesting? Those people who are trying to enslave you, do what with them? Send them away. For the son of the slave woman will not have a part of the father's property along with the son of the free woman. So then, my brothers and sisters, we are not the children of a slave woman, but of a free woman. I think the, Gen you think the Galatians understood the implication of what Paul was saying there the first time they heard it? Yeah. It's actually pretty difficult for us when we try to figure it out. Once you get it, well, then you, you kind of see it. Mm -hmm. But um, who knows how they got it. Many, script, many scholars regard this as one of the most difficult parts of the book of Galatians. Some think it's one of the more difficult parts of the New Testament. It involves people doing things which seem very strange to our modern thinking. Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham as a secondary wife or concubine in order to claim Hagar's child as her own. Any of you tried that recently? <laughs> kind of like adopting. Okay. Isn't it? Yeah. Or a surrogate. Well, actually, it turns out that there are ancient records available to us now that say that that was an acceptable way to get an heir among the people from which Abraham and Sarah came. But you have to admit, it's a, it's a plan that could be laid out by us to make it happen, mm -hmm. whereas the other one, right. by a, a woman who's past childbirth, mm -hmm. then having a child, there's, there's no other explanation except the promise came through. Yeah, yeah but we're looking at it retrospectively. Yeah. Well, I think even then, because 
if you <laughs> had this old lady have a baby. Well, I know. That's and that what would. I'm saying. I mean, yeah. yeah. They gave up. They didn't think. I mean, how? Anyway. Well, it takes continue. takes giving up. Takes giving up. Once again, conceive. Sarah was trying to work things out for herself. She had stopped having periods, and there was no sign of the promised son. So what do you do? You help God. You do what you can. You That's do what Sarah said <laughs> okay. and Abraham said. Well, God and Abraham sealed an agreement by passing between animals that had been cut in half. Any of you have done that? Nope. Thus we have the Old Testament expression, cutting an agreement. That's what it says literally in the Hebrew. The implication was that just as one, anim one killed animals to seal the agreement, cut them in half and spread them out, he would be subject to death if he broke it. Mm -hmm. How does that hit you? No, extor no extortion there, is there? <laughs> well, there could still be extortion, but there's no other promise that you can go, no further that you can go but than to say that if I break my promise, you can kill me. Yeah. And that's basically what you're saying when you did that, yeah. that little thing they did. Do you think anybody besides Abraham had any awareness of that whole sequence, or was it, did he see it just in vision? You mean, did it really happen or just be in vision? Well, envision is really happening too. I'm just asking, how do you think it really happened? Do you think, do you th remember that that smoking pot or fire pot or whatever what that passed between the animals? Why would God choose to represent Himself that way? How else could He do that? I what? mean, I mean, this is supposed to be God walking through. Are you going to just have a person that looks like a man? Well, he, he did that other times with Abraham, didn't he? What? He did that on other occasions with Abraham. What do you mean? He walked up there with two angels that looked like dr human beings, dirty and dusty, and Abraham ran out and said, please stop and have a meal with me. Yeah, but that was kind of the Son of God type of thing. But this is, this kind of this represents... This is the Son of God. Well, this represents the whole thing. Okay. I mean, to have a, a man type of thing walk through, there's still question in with my mind whether it really happened that way visually or whether it happened to Abraham in a vision, that's how God presented himself. Yeah, yeah. Well, Abraham really cut animals in pieces and spread them out there. So that part was real. At least that's what the Bible says. He chased off a... Chased the, a chased the vultures away. Vultures. Yeah. What, what do you think the significance of that was? Well, I, I can tell you, having lived in not too far from that part of the world, there are lots of vultures around. They see dead meat. Boy, they're on top of it really fast. Well, that's, that explains that. That's true, but do you see any symbolic meaning of that? Oh, yeah, sure. He, 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 this is a sacrifice to God. This is an agreement, and we're not having anybody else interrupt it. For the, Especially, cutting, of, for the cutting of an agreement, didn't that come out of the, the pagan ideas of that time? Possibly. I mean, what other ideas could they come out of? I mean, so God is meeting them where they, where they are here exactly. in, that, in that cutting of an agreement. Well, let's go back even further. Look at the contract or the covenant that God, or the agreement that God had with Adam and Eve in the garden. What, what, what were parts of that covenant? They were supposed to have children. They were supposed to spread out over all the earth and occupy, over, spread out and occupy the whole world. They were supposed to work during six days of the week. They were supposed to rest on the Sabbath. And they were supposed to stay away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Is any of those steps really difficult to do? Yes. Apparently it was for Adam and Eve. He didn't. The, um, the serpent was kind of uh, what made the difficulty. Well, yeah, but you aren't supposed to go anywhere near the guy. Stay away from him. Yeah, but it was right next to the tree of life. Mm -hmm. How can you get away from him when the tree of life is right there? Well, obviously, the sin, sin changed all that. Natural obedience to God became impossible. When they were still in the garden, obedience was natural. So in order to restore a relationship between God and human beings, God's grace entered the picture. And we talk about the great covenant 
spelled out in Genesis 3.15. Let me just read that to you. I'm reading it from my Good News Bible. I will make you, and who's, who's, he, who's God speaking to here? Serpent. The serpent. He's speaking to the serpent. Um, I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. Does that sound like a covenant? Yes, it's a promise. It's a promise, okay. Does there any, do, do you see any gospel in that? I don't see really an agreement, if we put it in that term. It's a threat. Yeah. Uh -oh. What? It's a threat. Yeah. It's a threat. It's a promise. What do you mean by a threat? Well, I'm going to do this to you, serpent. That's what he was saying. Well, it sounds to me like you think that you two are going to get together against me. It's not going to happen. They're going to be split. Okay. Where's the gospel in that? Does it just jump out at you? Well, since we're not uniting with Satan, that means he won't be able to murder us, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be kind of good news, wouldn't it? Yeah. Does crushing the serpent's head sound like the gospel? In what sense is war between the serpent and the woman a foretaste of the gospel of good news? Does the great controversy have something to do with the gospel? I think God was looking down through the ages and he, he, that's what he said was going to happen from there on, that eventually the devil would die and she would survive. Well, back up a little bit. What was the issue? God says, if you eat the fruit, you're going to die. Satan said, no, you're not. Just help yourself. He said, no, you're not. That's a lie. Yeah. God's lying to you. Yeah. And who's telling us the truth? That's the issue in the great controversy. Who is telling us the truth? Do we believe it? Do we, have tr do we trust it? Do we believe it? Well, why did God give circumcision to Abraham and his family? Unbelief. Okay. Well, in the, in the initial context, it's very likely, as some scholars have suggested, that the idea was for Jewish males to be circumcised so that uh, if they were tempted to get involved in some of the fertility cult religious affairs, as orgies and so forth, it would be obvious that they were Jewish males. What about, Jewish males. what about the women? How come he didn't figure out something for them? Um, they weren't good enough? That's a good question. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if that's, that's the exact reason of circumcision. Okay, it's come up with that. a better one. It's, it's the flesh. It's removing the flesh and becoming more spiritual. Is that obvious? If you're, if you're circumcised when you're eight days old and you grow up, and you say, it doesn't have to be obvious to the baby. Uh -huh. it, it will be one of these days, but it's obvious to the parents. Okay. Well, there certainly was a lot of sexuality in the religions, the pagan religions around Abraham and right down through the days of Paul. I mean, if you start studying about what was going on in Antioch and Ephesus and Corinth, even the stuff he talks about, you know, it's just, and in those days, if you joined, you, you joined the gym and had a gym membership, you exercised in the nude. Mm -hmm. So it would be obvious which group you belong to. Well, does practicing circumcision represent a do-it-yourself religion? Well, what are the Judaizers? What, what do you think their selling point was? Before you go on, you asked that question, would God give a do-it-yourself religion? God gave this yeah. ordinance, right? Or yeah. this, what, you know, is, is there some other reason that he gave it other than a couple of things that you've mentioned? Well, Abraham tried to do a do-it-yourself religion. Mm -hmm. And circumcision would certainly remind him of that fact. Okay. 
he, he didn't do the circumcision until after he had a secondary wife and a, an, and, and a child. And, a child. Mm -hmm. and he circumcised that child. Same time he circumcised himself. And it wasn't at eight days. It was not at eight days. I've often wondered with what. Yeah. <laughs> a knife. Yeah, yes, they probably had knives or something. Well, in those days they didn't have iron. It would have to be bronze maybe or something like that. <coughs> Obsidian. Yeah. Obsidian, Obsidian, yeah, yes. probably. That's a good one. I never thought of that. Well, eight-day-old boys, that's the way it's supposed to be done. By the way, those of you who are physicians, Today. why do we circumcise on the eighth day? Their coagulation. Abilities. The coagulation abilities are at their highest point yes. right then. Yeah. What if the child is premature? Do they still do it at eight days? Yeah, they still do it at eight days because remember, it, that 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 surge in in, in and coagulatable possibilities is a function of the liver. And if the liver doesn't function, then the child, of course, does, doesn't survive. But if the liver starts working, then whoosh, that's what happens. But in the, in the Jewish culture, if, if the child was born premature, they would still circumcise at the eighth day? Eight days. Eight days. They, they, had, they, had, they, they were not nearly as precise as we are at trying to figure out with our uh, ultrasounds and all that kind of stuff, well, exactly the when the... four-pounder that came out. Yeah, sure. So, we ask ourselves, what is the relationship between circumcision and do-it-yourself religion? Abraham and Ishmael were the do-it-yourself pair that thought that they were going to be God's appointed people, right? And Paul's day were, day were the Judaizers and others like them circumcising their children and being circumcised themselves because they believed they were pleasing God? It was part of the ritual to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. How many other Old Testament experiences and stories would fall into that category of attempting to please God? How much do we do to try to please God? Give us some examples of what you think. Well, here's an example. Let's, let's look at the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai. They have just escaped from Egyptian slavery. They've just arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses goes up and talks to God a little bit, comes back and tells them what they're supposed to do, uh, comes back and says, God's getting ready to talk to you. He's going to give you some instructions. And what, what do they say? Then all this is Exodus 19.8. This is before God has spoken, before he's appeared on the mountain. Then all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. They did the same thing with Joshua. Oh, yeah. And, and, and then, then they cap it off, well, if anybody disobeys, kill them. Yeah. I mean, that was a ment mental approach. That, uh, that was an improvement over the last time, huh? But that's well, we're going <laughs> to Joshua <laughs> chapter 1. For, yeah. Well, what happened then is God appears, appears, in the, appears on the mount, gives the Ten Commandments, gives the stuff to Moses, does all those arrangements and so forth, and Moses comes down and said, you heard what God said? Yeah, let me repeat it. Da -da -da. He repeats the whole thing. Whatever God says, we'll just do it. So Moses is still not too sure they really understand the implications. So he sits down and he writes it all out. And I said, let me, let me, this is all in chapter 24. Let me read it to you. So he reads it to them. Whatever the Lord says, we'll do. Think they really meant it? For that moment. <laughs> For that moment. In a superficial way. Are there any hints in our religion today that might suggest we are trying a do-it-yourself religion? Do we ever get tired of waiting for God? Do we sometimes think that our idea of timing is better than God's idea of timing? Well, maybe God wants me to do what I can. I see. Then he'll fill in the blanks if, if I don't do it right. <laughs> I see. Oh, boy. If we choose to wait for God to lead the way, does that help us to grow patience, love, and faith? Well, look at the promise God made to 
uh, Abraham in Genesis 12 is one of the first promises. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country. Now this, Abraham is 75 years old. He does not, he's married to his half-sister. He does not have any children. Leave your country, your relatives and your father's home and go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. When Abraham was 75 years old, he started out from Haran, as the Lord had told him to do, and Lot went with him. Abraham took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the wealth and all the slaves they had acquired in Haran, and they started out for the land of Canaan. What was the lifespan, the average lifespan? I mean, Abraham. Well, all we have is Abraham himself. He lived to be 180. So 75, he was still pretty young. And his son, Isaac, lived something like 160. Yeah. yeah. And his father, Who didn't he have his age? I don't think so. Yeah, maybe not. Now, 75 is young. Mm -hmm. Even now it's young. <laughs> Looking younger and younger. Yeah. <laughs> Look specifically at the promises God made to Abraham recorded in these verses. How do you think Abraham responded? I mean, how would you respond? You're 75 years old. Your wife must be approaching menopause. You have no children. You're, you're a, a, a leader, a spiritual leader, but, you know, God says, you're going to be the father of multitudes. Why do you think Abraham was chosen? Was it random? No. No. no I don't think so. Why do you think? Do you think that, that, don't you think that God asked several people to do that sort of thing? Maybe everyone, and Abraham's the only one that uh, took him up on it? The possibility we don't know about any of the others. No, we don't. But uh, this is this is the the Bible is the story of Abraham's line. Yeah. Would be nice if somebody would mention that in the Bible if they yeah. did do a script skip. Yeah. Well, you could go to Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse eight, but you got to use the RSV or the uh, Septuagint, I believe, as, as well as the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the ESV also has it. Uh, when uh, 32.8 when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance when he separated the sons of men he fixed the bounds of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God and uh, but and then verse 9 the Lord's portion is his people Jacob his allotted heritage and uh, God chose those, but he permitted these sons of God, these other what we call heavenly intelligences, to spread their lies to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, that, that's one way of understanding it. Focusing on what we're, what Paul is really talking about here, it's clear that the promises to Abraham had to include the birth of a son. I mean, that's, there's no way you can get around that. He has to have a son. Now, legit, adopted or whatever, he has to have a son. So 10 more years go by with no sign of an heir and Sarah no longer having periods. Didn't it seem like God's promises were not reliable? Do you think that Abraham had been praying to God and asking questions? Mm -hmm. Possible. Are questions the same as doubts? Not necessarily. <laughs> well, they probably turn more into doubts as the longer it went. I have a feeling, though, that uh, Abraham thought when God promised him a son that it was going to happen kind of the natural way of happening. What would you expect? Yeah, yeah. And then when it when that seemed started impossible. getting older and older, and all of a sudden you know, after periods and all that stuff. Um, what else are you going to, you can start questioning there, right? So how does God respond? He comes with that cutting animals in half thing that we talked about and says, let me make this 
covenant, this agreement, this promise. Let's make it really serious. Let's cut some animals in half, and we'll we'll make this. It a looks real like he's voc focusing in on the promise and just taking all this other stuff out that we usually look okay. for, and just when it's all said and done, all that's left is the promise. Okay. And well, today if God appeared to you in a vision and said that He wanted you to make a covenant, He wanted to make a covenant with you, would you want it to be drawn up by an attorney and signed by God? Is that sort of what a verbal it, agreement's okay with me? A verbal agreement's okay with, with God. <laughs> with God, <laughs> you know, like the old sign you used to see in some stores: uh, "In God we trust; everyone else pays cash." That's right. <laughs> How often does God ask us to believe things which seem impossible? Surely the possibility for Sarah to have a child seemed more and more remote as the years went by. You notice, well, though, that this promise is, is something that took a long time. It, they had to live with it. Mm -hmm. If God, if somebody promised you something to be impossible right off the, right off the bat, tomorrow some a diamond's going to fall out of the sky and into your hands, mm -hmm. you know. That's way different than, than what's happening here. And how about the doubts that, of both Sarah and Abraham going, well, Sarah's going, maybe I'm not the right one. Maybe I'm the problem. Mm -hmm. I'm not the right wife for Abraham. I'm not the one to be the, the mother of. Yeah. Well, in the book of Revelation, Chapter 13, it suggests that someday the United States will join forces with the Catholic Church to lead the world in, in opposing God's true people. Does that seem likely right now? Does it say that in Revelation? It says that in I Revelation. Think, I think you're interpreting Revelation as that. I'm interpreting Revelation. I, okay, maybe you better say that. Yeah. It's pretty solid. Pretty solid. They'll be yeah. looking up enough Revelation saying, where's, where's the United States and where's Revelation the Revelation 13. I don't see any. I don't see the word Catholics. I don't see the word United States. Do so a little you're research. You're interpreting it. Do a little research. Well, it's still interpretation, but I'm not saying that it's wrong. Yeah. But I'm just saying that. Why is it so we'll difficult it. for human beings to be patient and let God work things out according to His schedule? Is there a relationship between patience and faith? Everybody muses. Yeah. I think so. It's interesting that in Galatians 5 coming up, we're not going to go there yet, but in that, in that fruit of the Spirit, the last word in that list is self control. Uh, does that have anything to do with self, do it yourself religion? Well, when Sarah stopped having periods, what do you think Abraham said to her? And what did she say? You know, what could she say? I've got an idea. <laughs> I've got an idea. Well, she recommended following the customs that were common in her culture in those days, let's get a surrogate. And there was Hagar. And Hagar fairly quickly got pregnant. These things seem really strange to us, but lo and behold, here is Ishmael, and now we have a, teen, a, a young man who's growing up in the household, loved by Abraham. I mean, he was his son. He's, he, the, the, he, he thought it was his son of promise that he'd been waiting for for so many years. And then what happened? <clears throat> God came down. Look at Genesis 17, 15 and following. God said to Abraham, You must no longer call your wife Sarai. From now on, her name is Sarah. I will bless her and I will give you a son by her. This is the first time that we know of when he has specifically said, The promised son is going to be from Sarah. I will bless her and she will become the mother of nations, and there will be kings among her descendants. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground, but he began to laugh 
when he thought, can a man have a child when he is 100 years old, and can Sarah have a child at 90? He asked God, why not let Ishmael be my heir? And you know the, how that all worked out. Well, the answer to that was yes. <laughs> See, I'm laughing. Yeah. The whole idea is funny. Yeah. Well, why did God think it was necessary to wait that long? Yeah. What was the reason? I mean, there's no question about the fact that Isaac is a miracle baby. Mm -hmm. you just, there's no way you yeah. can get around that. Um, and later, Sarah laughed, and she lied about it. So they, they named the baby what? Laughter. <laughs> oh, boy. Why are we so often tempted to run ahead of God? Do we lack faith? Or is it seems like in our short little lifespans, we have a hard time allowing the time for God's will to work out? Well, it seems like a long time for us. It's not forgotten, but it seems. There are people who make foxhole promises. What's a foxhole promise? Save me, and I'll do anything. Yeah. Help me out of this mess, and I'll, I'll pay tithe the rest of my life. I'll do this, I'll do that. I'll join the church. Just anything. I'll become a pastor. Is that an Old Testament kind of covenant? Agreement? promise I could hear the Israelites saying that yeah I'll do anything yeah I, I think at the, at the bottom of Mount Sinai at the time when God came down and spoke and here's this black cloud and there's lightning shooting out of the black cloud and the whole mountain and the whole territory is shaking and they're with, with their faces in the, in the dirt and noses in the dirt at that point in time, I think you'd promise almost anything, right? Well, what's the sequence to the story? When Isaac was about 20 years old, Abraham received that very strange message from God to take him out and sacrifice him. And this is the story in Genesis 22. Why did God ask Abraham to do such a thing? I mean, wasn't that really pushing it? I mean, a little ridiculous, right? Did, did Abraham question whether it was really God speaking to him? You think he was surprised? Abraham? He was surprised by the request? Yeah. Yeah, I think he was surprised by the request. Even though all the, all the people, all the other religions ask for that kind of thing. But here is the promised son. That you've been waiting for this a hundred years, or at least 90 years. Your promise on the one God has promised to you, and now God says, take him and sacrifice him. But what about your question? Would I sacrifice my greatest thing for my God? Yeah. It would, wouldn't that bother you too? Yeah, if you were sure that's what God was asking you to do. Well, everybody else was doing it. For some reason, our God didn't ask for it. Is it because He's scared to ask me? Well, let let let's let's take the let's back off a little bit and look at the larger view. When Abraham took Hagar and ended up with Ishmael and all that business, what do you think Satan had to say to the onlooking universe? Look at this friend of God. How, how he's behaving. When he lied about his wife twice, what did Satan say to the universe? As this is this is the kind of friend God's friends God hangs out with. This is the best you can do, God. Yeah, is this the best you can do, God? But Abraham finally learned to wait patiently on God and to follow God's instructions. What do we learn about the relationship with Abraham and God from the experience on Mount Moriah? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to read you a few passages from Ellen White where she describes that experience. Look at this carefully. Abraham's great act of faith stands like a pillar of light illuminating the pathway of God's servants in all succeeding 
ages. Abraham did not seek to excuse himself from doing the will of God. Do we ever sort of waffle around doing what God wants us to do? During that three days journey, he had sufficient time to reason and to doubt God. And what does Hebrews 11 tell us were his thoughts? Good. Either he will raise him from the dead or he will provide a substitute. Yeah, Abraham says, God has promised me that this son is going to be the son of the promise. There's got to be a way through this somehow or other. That was his conclusion. Well, during that three days of journey, he had sufficient time to reason and to doubt God if he was disposed to doubt. And Ellen White elsewhere says, he did sleep a wink that whole day, all day and night. He, he was thinking, to, talking to God and praying. And He might have reasoned that the slaying of his son would cause him to be looked upon as a murderer, a second Cain, that it would cause his teaching to be rejected and despised and thus destroy his power to do good to his fellow men. Um, I have mentioned previously elsewhere that uh, Ellen White says that there were a thousand households that Abraham was responsible for, all the people who worked for him, etc. And he would call these people in and he would, he would instruct them. What, what do you suppose he would say? I mean, he must have wondered, okay, what am I going to say to these people when I come back without my, without my son? Which aspect of God asked Abraham to do that? And how do we put uh, James 1.13 in there yeah. and Malachi 3.6? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Micah 6, 6 through 8. Yep. Uh, how, how do we fit all those together? I mean, it it's, uh, yep. almost defies, it defies logic easily. Um, well, the sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefits of succeeding generations, but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and of other worlds. Now, if we're going to be faithful Adventists, we're going to have to ask ourselves, okay, what did the angels learn from this experience? Well, the field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of salvation is wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. What field is that? 1 Corinthians 4, 9. This earth is the theater of the universe, right? Because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises, Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to... Can you think of any other times when Satan accused someone before God? Job. Job. Sure. Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and as unworthy of its blessings. So what is Satan claiming? God's not fair. God's not fair, you have to hand him over to me. I, I will take charge of Abraham. He's mine now. It's kind of legalistic, isn't it? Satan doesn't care what kind of arguments he has yeah, to use. Yeah, but God does. He's been trying to tell us. We've all been t yell, uh, arguing about what's legalistic and what, is, what, is it, what isn't, what's faith. Mm -hmm. So. Well, God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heaven, not before the earth, before heaven, to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. Perfect obedience, where does that come from? Well, it's not natural for human beings if that's your question. Well, if he's testing for perfect obedience, where is it coming from? If he's defined obedience as a willingness to listen or to take and to take instruction, which is really the same thing. Uh, if you understand. So is, is all that coming from us? No, not at all. Yeah, it, it, it's only worked out as a, as a part of the relationship that God had with Abraham. And, and basically, Satan has made all kinds of accusations against God. I mean, how many people does God uh, have on his side that he's able to focus on down here on planet Earth at that point in time? Well, maybe Melchizedek. 
Well, heavenly beings were witnesses of the scene as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac was tested. I can assure you that the entire universe was focused on what was happening right there. And they learned. Well, hold on. Okay. The trial was far more severe than that which had been brought upon Adam. Compliance with the prohibition laid upon our first parents involved no suffering, but the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. All heaven applauded his fidelity. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. Is it important to show that Satan's accusations are false? Yes. Absolutely. God declared to his servant, Now I know that thou fearest God, notwithstanding Satan's charges, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Genesis twenty-two twelve. God's covenant, confirmed to Abraham by an oath before the intelligences of other worlds, testified that obedience will be rewarded. It had been difficult, even for the angels, to grasp the mystery of redemption, to com comprehend that the commander of heaven, the Son of God, must die for guilty man. Now, what's logical about that? When the command was given to Abraham to offer up his son, the interest of all, all heavenly beings was enlisted. With intense earnestness, they watched each step in the fulfillment of this command. When to Isaac's question, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham made answer, God will provide himself a lamb. Now, what did Abraham think it was going to be at that point in time? His son. His son. Yeah. And when the father's hand was stayed as he was about to slay his son, and the ram which God had provided was offered in the place of Isaac, then light was shed upon the mystery of redemption, and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. Patriarchs and Prophets 153 to 155. Well, notice specifically that God called on Abraham to demonstrate something for the benefit of the onlooking universe. Should that remind us of the story of Job? Well, how did Moses understand these two stories? Remember that Moses wrote Genesis and Job while tending sheep in Midian before returning to Egypt. How well do you think Abraham and Moses understood the great controversy? Did they understand about Satan? Did they understand about his accusations? We just don't know. We don't know how much God tried to explain to them. Moses clearly spelled it out in the things he wrote. I mean, when I say that, it means a number of things he said clearly fit in with our understanding of the great controversy. Was he just writing something he didn't understand fully himself? Peter suggests that a lot of the old Testament prophets wrote things they didn't fully understand themselves. And why should they if it's coming from God? Well, we have to be careful. If you say they did understand it, well, then it'd be easy to say they came up with it. Well, I'll read you this passage. The long years amid desert solitudes were not lost. Talking about the life of Moses. This is Ellen White, Signs of the Times, February 19, 1880, quoted in the Bible Commentary. Not only was Moses gaining a preparation for the great work before him, but during this time, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Genesis and also the book of Job which would be read with the deepest interest by the people of God until the close of time. Is that proving to be true? Some people. Yeah. Well, the people of God. It, it's not saying by everybody. Certainly not by everybody. So now we come back to Paul. Paul then went on to compare the experience of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar with the experience of the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai. What is the relationship between those two events? Abraham and Hagar got Ishmael. That was a do-it-yourself program, right? God said, I want to talk to the children of Israel, and they said, anything that God says, we'll just do it. Is that a do-it-yourself program? 
Well, what kind of relationship was God trying to develop with his people at Sinai? He was offering them the same deal that they had, yeah. offering them the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Is there evidence of that? Yeah, let's let's. I'm going to just show you some right he says now. I will make you kingdom of, of priests. Mm -hmm. And the Lord called him from the mountains and told him, uh, where, "Hold where on, I grabbed from the wrong place here. I wanted to go to. Uh, no, that's correct. Exodus 19." The Lord called him from the... Verse 3. What? 19, verse 3. Yeah. Moses went up the mountain to meet with God. The Lord called him from the mountains and told him to say to the Israelites, Jacob's descendants, you saw what I, the Lord, did to the Egyptians, how I carried you as an eagle carries her young on her wings and brought you here to me. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. That's the first thing. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people a people dedicated to me alone, you will serve, as my, serve me as priests. So Moses went down and called the leaders of the people together and told them everything the Lord had commanded him. Is there any other time in the Bible where it talks about God calling a special people and they're supposed to be God's chosen people and serve as priests? First Peter, he says, this is God's modern church. Our modern and was in Peter's day. Since Abraham and all of his male descendants and workers were circumcised and later those descendants were called to be God's special possession, don't you suppose that the Judaizers in Paul's day said, if you want to be a part of God's special people and be one of his special possessions, you must be circumcised as Abraham and his descendants were. Wasn't that a logical argument? In Paul's day, who were the promised possessions of God? Well, look at 1 Peter 2.9, as I said. But now, Peter speaking to the Christians, you are a chosen race, the king's priest, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What's Peter doing here? He's using the wording of what God used to Moses in calling his people out of Egypt and he's now applying it to whom? Christians, right? Christians, yeah. New covenant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does God want to enter into that kind of a relationship with the Christian church uh, today? Does God want to be our friend? When God spoke to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, did he suggest that they establish a covenant relationship? What was different about the promises made at Sinai versus the promises made earlier to Abraham and then later to, to Jeremiah? We've said it before, but let's nail it down. That in the first covenant, it's the people promising to do what God asked them to do. In the second covenant, which is really given before the first covenant, and he's promised to God. Who's doing the promising? God, is. God does all the promising. <clears throat> Well, what role did Hagar play in the whole story? Was she just a pawn? Well, was it the attitude of Hagar and Ishmael and their feelings about Isaac that made it necessary for them to leave the camp of Abraham? Probably so. Yeah. Clearly, Abraham and Sarah were the ones who caused the problem in the beginning. Weren't they the ones that were responsible? Yes. Hagar and Ishmael repeated the results of Abraham's attempts, uh, uh, reaped the results of Abraham's attempts at do it yourself religion. Once again, Satan must have laughed all over the universe. So, what was the application uh, the Judaizers were trying to make? Didn't, don't you think they said, Look, God said, if you want to be my special people, you'll be circumcised. And how was Paul count countering that? You remember what he's going to say in just a few verses further down? I Actually, he's already said it. I'm sorry, back in chapter 3. Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, makes no difference to God whatsoever. How do you suppose the Judaizers responded to that? How 
have on our own day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Judaizers represented an illegitimate religion as sort of relying on the flesh. Ishmael and Hagar were finally sent away because Ishmael was making fun of the young Isaac. Of course, it would have been natural for Abraham and Sarah to bestow special favors on Isaac. I mean, what do you expect? After all, he was born miraculously as the heir of the promise. How would you expect Ishmael and Hagar to feel about that sudden change in their status? I mean, try to imagine the first time Hagar, and even Ishmael for that matter, hears Sarah comes out and says, uh, I think I'm pregnant. How did she know? I mean, yeah. normally women know you? because they stop having periods. She long ago stopped having periods. At some point in time, she, has to, she had to say, I'm pretty sure I'm pregnant. Well, do you think Ishmael and, Isaac, and, Ishmael and Hagar were actually hostile to Isaac? There are many examples in ancient times when people who aspired to high positions killed their competitors in order to eliminate them and secure their own position. Judges 9 is an example of that. How can we, without being judgmental or prejudicial, reach out to those who are still uh, caught up in a do-it-yourself mode of religion and convince them that God has a better plan for their lives? How, how do, I mean, I suppose we ought to, it would be fair to say, what are the do-it-yourself do religions of our day? Those who flagellate themselves, those who make pilgrimages to certain famous places, those who give large sums of money to build churches or to enrich some kind of statues or something else like that. Do they do it because they think they're pleasing God? their way to heaven. Their way to heaven, yeah. They, they buy their way to heaven, right? Yeah. Well, are there any do-it-yourself religions in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? I think maybe we better stop there and let you yeah. think about that. Thank you for joining us. Uh, there's a lot of questions we've covered today. Our kind and loving Father, it's a great privilege to think about you, to talk about you as we meet together from time to time. We find that these lessons are raising a lot of really challenging questions. Are we prepared to deal with them? Can we hold in memory certain questions that maybe we can't fully answer until someday that you'll be able to answer them for us? Are we mature enough to do that? Help us now to have learned something from our time together here today that will be of help for us in the future to be faithful to your word is our prayer in Jesus' name.